Hello there, I'm Brian Taylor. Down the years you may have seen me on the telly or heard me on the wireless, but this is different. This is the Brian Taylor podcast brought to you by The Herald. What I would emphasize is that we have the vaccines now. We don't have any evidence that they won't protect against severe disease and mortality. So I'm really hoping still that this Christmas will be quite different to last year. That will have a de detrimental impact on all our cancer outcomes as we come out of this. And we need to actually get back to that focus on other health issues. The storms at the weekend have shown us that we need more community resilience there as well to be able to support um, vulnerable people in, in, in situations like this. So I, I, I think it's all about building that community. Hello there, I'm Brian Taylor and welcome to a very special edition of My Herald podcast. In this episode, we'll address your questions and your worries about the, the COVID crisis. Later, I'll discuss that issue, the issue of COVID, the new Omicron variant, of course, with two senior politicians. But first, I'm going to put the questions that you have submitted, the questions you've sent in to an acknowledged expert, Professor Linda Ball of Edinburgh University. Linda, thanks very much indeed for, for joining me. I think it's fair to say we've had a wide range of questions, an indication, I'm sure, of, of public concern. How would, they, how would they be other than that? Let, let's just go through a few of the questions. We've received one from Cara Jones in Glasgow, first of all. Uh, she asks, is it likely that the eight-day self-isolation will be introduced this December for all travellers arriving to the UK? And basically, here we're talking about, you know, taking a PCR test two days after arriving. First Minister has suggested it should, and, and, and First Minister of Wales suggested it should also be an, an eight-day uh, check as well. Take us through this, this issue and wh where we are and, and where we might be. Well, thanks, Brian. Really nice to be here. So that's a very good question from Cara. Let me just start with the international context. So India has uh, yesterday introduced uh, a one week quarantine at home quarantine for travellers coming to India from the UK. There's been some discussion that the USA might do something similar. So this does seem to be the direction of travel for a number of countries around the world. And as you know, Israel and Japan have decided not to open their borders to others other than uh, nationals at the yeah. moment. Where we are in Scotland and the UK, as you say, is that the current recommendation is just for that day two PCR test. Will that change in future? The UK government has pushed back on that. Yes. Uh, what I would say is I'm, I'm really hopeful that we don't go in that direction unless we absolutely have to. And the main reason for that is when you see domestic spread of this variant, then these kinds of um, issues, you know, thinking about travel as the main source um, becomes less of an issue. But it's too early to tell whether that would occur. Governments are not ruling it out, but it's not the plan at the moment. But we have we have the issue of the two day. Let's let's tackle that as well. Building upon Cara's question, we had some controversy whether it was on the second day or within two days of arriving, and it really didn't appear to be very clear. Yeah, so it's very important to communicate. It is by day two. So you could have it on day one, you could have it on day two, you just need to get it by day two. And scientifically, there's actually a better argument for getting it as soon as possible after you arrive. Um, so that's that's where the you know you want to know about infection once you're back into the country ASAP. And what's the thinking about the eight day argument? The thinking there presumably is that you could come back within two days, it's okay, but you develop it later or, 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 or that? Yeah, so that, I mean, there was a case, wasn't there, of a doctor in Israel who thinks he picked it up um, on his last day in the UK at a conference. This is anecdotal and all speculation, but he's okay. now tested positive. He didn't test positive until a few days after returning to Israel. If your viral load is not high enough, the virus is building up in your body. You won't, you won't necessarily pick it up immediately. So that's the rationale. You get a PCR test, yeah, okay. But in answer to Kara's question, it, it doesn't seem at the moment likely that the eight-day rule will be introduced this December. It doesn't seem likely. That is not on the cards at the moment. The situation is moving rapidly, and I highlighted a couple of countries that have done yeah. that. My personal hope is that we do not have to go down that route, but it cannot be ruled out. Okay, thanks. Let, let's go to a question from Tom and Carol McDonald in Helensburg. Thanks for your question. They say they're visiting France over the Christmas period. A travel question, travel-related question. They've been told to require evidence of a COVID booster for their pass to get onto the ski slopes and hospitality and all that sort of thing. But they say that those booster doses don't show on the Scottish vaccine passports yet. Uh, what, what's the situation with that? So good news, and that is in hand, and there's rapid work underway. The NHS COVID pass in England already shows the booster. I think that's being introduced for Wales very soon. The vaccine team and those working on the app know it's a priority. I think it's absolutely imminent. What I would say on the plus side is the QR code. So it's actually not that difficult to, uh -huh. to allow it to be shown. 
So hopefully by the time you get to France, that will all be, well, before you get to France, that will all be sorted. And, and what about, you know, will the, 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 the passports generally, what, what are, they're now going to be used using evidence of, of, of other elements as well, aren't they? Not just um, your, your vaccine record. Well, I think you need to look at every single country. So let's just deal with domestically at the moment. Domestically in Scotland, if you needed to show your COVID app uh, vaccine evidence, it's just both doses you would need to show. Um, as you know, if you're going to a nightclub or the football, that's the alternative that's being introduced now is a lateral flow test. Uh-huh. In relation to what's required in different countries, it varies. It can be, it must be two or three doses of a vaccine, or it might be a recent infection, et cetera. It varies by country. I actually don't have the France regulations in front of me, but do check. What's what's your take, Linda, on whether this is sensible precaution or whether it's, uh, you know, interference with private citizens? What, what, what's your take on that argument? I think where we are at the moment, it is still needed and required. And in fact, I see Germany just this afternoon, uh, Brian, seems to be saying that they're not going to allow people who've not been fully vaccinated to access hospitality, et cetera. So countries are really taking these certification schemes seriously. I hope that they're in place for as short a time as possible, uh-huh. because we do not want to be having that kind of requirement indefinitely. OK, let's move to our uh... Excellent question from Colin Murdoch, who really gets right to the the root, I think, of public anxiety at the present moment. He's worried he won't get to spend Christmas with his family again this year because of the new variant. Basically saying, will there be more restrictions put in place? You know, you you talked there, you talked earlier about it being a moving situation, and it is. But I mean, you you can hear the anxiety that there is behind Colin's question there. Yes, and Colin, I share your anxiety, uh, uh, you know, about that. But what I would say is. Is very uncertain at the moment. Even if we had a big escalation of Omicron cases, it may be that we need to be a wee bit more worried about January than Christmas, just thinking about the trajectory. That's uncertain. All organizations, including government, of course, are considering what they have to do in a worst case scenario. But what I would emphasize is that we have the vaccines now. We don't have any evidence that they won't protect against severe disease and mortality. So I'm really hoping still that this Christmas will be quite different to last year. But If things get really tough, governments are going to have very few choices. I can't see the situation dramatically changing in the next couple of weeks. We have to watch this space. I know I'm saying that to every question. That's genuinely where we are scientifically at the moment. Well, it's interesting you say that because uh, Professor Jason Leach was giving evidence to the Parliamentary Committee today. And he said the phrase he uses on a daily basis is, give me more time, give me more time. Sometimes you ain't got more time. You just have to take a judgment based on the information you have. Let me just pick up on one, uh, a couple of things you said there. Omicron, how worried should we be by, by Omicron? How, how um, reassured should we be that the vaccine uh, that, that are presently there can tackle it? I think we should be worried by Omicron because it really genuinely does look more transmissible. We don't know about disease severity or immune escape from the vaccines, but we have confidence that even if the vaccines are weakened in terms of transmission and infection, that they will still work in saving people's lives, basically, even these current vaccines that we have. Yeah, and so I am, wor- I am worried, Brian, but I'm not, I'm not worried that the, I'm not saying these vaccines are useless. They are still working and they will still work, even if not as well against Omicron. OK, now uh, j- j- with the questions are still coming in. We've got one in the last few seconds from James in Largs. He says, at 80 plus and having both jabs and the booster, Am I less at risk of the new variant or or not? That's a, a really tough. So, James, from what we know so far, which is very preliminary, you are certainly at less risk from this variant and any other variant with both doses of a vaccine and a booster. And the reason I say that is because when you get your booster, your antibody levels go up again, you mount an immune response. You're also your T cell and your B cell memory cells are strengthened. So your body is in a much better position to fight off any infection. We have questions about this variant and the current vaccines, but nobody's suggesting that this variant is going to be a disaster for the vaccine. So you're far better to have those vaccines. OK, so so w- w- whatever, it's better with the vaccine than... than Absolutely. Than the, uh, ask you about that. Uh, one from Jean Mary Knowles. Gia, thanks very much for your question from, from Isla. Question from all over Scotland now. With the rapid changes of hospital admissions in South Africa, do you think the Scottish regulations are currently adequate, especially with the closeness of the, the festive season? She also wonders whether PCR testing should be required for all travellers by air? Well, PCR testing, so let's just deal with that one. We're not requiring PCR before you come back into the country. That might change. We are requiring it on day two. I think the current approach is proportionate. You know, if we just said, okay, let's just in- implement a lockdown now because we're worried about a new variant, and then we discovered in two or three weeks from the science that actually it was not as disastrous as 
we'd intended we would have damaged education, businesses, et cetera. Um, so it's, I think where we are now is reasonable. Many countries are doing similar things, um, but the, you know, the option is there to take more action if we need it. So it's this word proportionate, isn't it? It's proportionate. But on the other hand, it's, it's precautionary as well, isn't it? You, 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 you have to think, you have to think the, prepare for the worst and hope for the best, basically, don't you? Yeah, and, and universities are doing this, the government's doing this, businesses are doing it. They're saying, okay, here's our emergency plan if we need to put it in place. So let's remind ourselves, Brian, of the four harms. Uh, harm three is social harms. Harm four is the economy. Harm one is the virus to health. And harm two is the NHS and social care. We need to keep in mind all of those and we need to balance them. Uh, Jean also asks, well, if, if there is PCR, universal PCR testing for travellers by air, should this be funded by the UK government? Against the argu- I guess the argument against that is you, you, can, you can choose not or to, to, to fly. You know? Well, I, don't, I actually, my personal view is the government shouldn't be expected to fund that. Okay. Um, I do think we need free asymptomatic testing and symptomatic testing within the country, and we have it. And we are hugely fortunate to have these tests widely available that we can use regularly. We, That's the ones you know, you pick up in pharmacy. The, you know. Yeah, in many countries you have to pay, and it's big inequality. But when you're making the choice to go abroad, you know, you, for your employer or for your own purposes, I know the I know the price is certainly probably too high, and there's discussion about are the providers taking advantage, but. I think it's reasonable for people to have to ber- take that on themselves. Okay, a couple more questions, then I'm going to ask you just maybe some, some general comments on where we are. Question from Thomas Harvey in uh, Loch Maben. Um, his wife was recently hospitalized with extremely high temperature. She was told it was a respiratory viral infection. Now, basically, she passed a PCR test. He wonders whether she can now be tested retrospectively to see if she had Omicron. Well, I'm, first of all, really, really sounds an, an awful experience to go through. I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, the answer, short answer is no. If you've, what the PCR will do is pick up genetic material from the virus that can then be sequenced. You have to have that positive test during an infection. So picks up any, any variant, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we can't tell whether she's had it. She could look at whether she has antibodies to COVID-19 if she was in the ONS infection survey or, or you know, you can purchase antibody tests, although they vary, and I wouldn't recommend that. But we, we wouldn't be able to tell from an antibody test whether she had antibodies to this variant or any other, okay. unfortunately. Uh, uh, another question, Tom Strang, um, where's Tom from again? He's from Glasgow, I think. Uh, yes, he is. I, I'm going to summarize his, his question. Basically, it, it's it's about traveling to the, to the, to the U.S., and the, the, the advice being that if you have had COVID within 90 days, you shouldn't take a PCR test because it, it can still pick up positive signs. Instead, you should get a letter from a medical practitioner. Basically, Tom is really struggling to get information on this. He's, he's, he's due to go to the U.S. on 29th of December. He's got a test booked for the 26th, but he's now, he's now worried, basically. Have you heard of this, the, this idea of medical practitioners being given, given uh, certification? Instead yeah, of- I, I, can't, I can't directly advise Tom there. I, what I would say is my understanding from the Canadian context, which would be very similar to the US, if you can provide evidence of that infection, which would be your previous positive test, uh-huh. that that is permitted by the authorities. That's certainly the case for Canada. Um, I don't know about this medical letter. It will be important no. to get some advice on that and, and perhaps speak to your GP, but that doesn't sound like it's been well, a great... He's, he's, he's hoping to, but he's really struggling to get information. And I know it's difficult because yeah. this is really is quite an unusual... The thing. only other thing I would say on the 90-day PCR, um, in our own, this is a research study, and I emphasize yeah. this, um, that I'm involved in. We're finding it unlikely that, you know, in that the last period of those 90 days that the PCR would pick up genetic material from the virus. I think... Um, you know, it's, it's more likely that closer to that infection, you'd still get a positive PCR. I can realize I haven't answered Tom questions, Tom's no, no. questions but I hope that's helpful. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Uh, um, a couple more um, that, we, uh, that, that, that were raised this morning in the committee. Um, Jason Leach was asked whether it was still acceptable to take the vaccine when pregnant. What's, what's the answer there? I cannot emphasize enough the importance of getting vaccinated when you're pregnant. You're at severe risk from COVID-19, as is the baby, particularly in the final trimester of pregnancy, but throughout. We know that pregnant women have been in intensive care and we've had you know, some very poor outcomes for, with unvaccinated pregnant women. Go online, look at the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, a really accessible, accurate source. They've got information for women and families. Please get vaccinated if you're pregnant. You're stressing the accurate source there, presumably by a contradistinction with some of the um, uh, more gossipy stuff that one, one sees occasionally online. There was a head of story today, of course, about a rise in 
neonatal deaths, but it was also being stressed that this was not linked to COVID or indeed to to the the, the vaccine. Uh, Jason was also asked this morning about cancer, those undergoing cancer treatment. Um, sh- should they get va- vaccination? Presumably, they should check with their clinicians as well. Yeah, in the vast majority of cases, people who are um, have are have been undergoing or been diagnosed with cancer absolutely should take up the vaccine. Some of them may be immunosuppressed or immunocompromised as a result of cancer treatment, which suppresses the immune system in order to allow the body to respond to the treatments. In in those cases, you're also eligible. But I would emphasize, because cancer treatment is not a single thing, there are many different types. Yes, please speak to your oncologist or your GP if you've got any concerns. But the general advice for cancer patients is, of course, take up your vaccine. Two final questions from me, Linda. Many thanks for dealing with these. Many thanks for, for dealing with the ones from our our audience. Question one from me, what do you say to those who campaign against vaccination? Um, Yeah, well, I get a lot of these messages myself. I think they're doing themselves and others a huge disservice. Um, They're peddling misinformation in the vast majority of cases, and they're causing real harm. Um, I think if people have genuine questions, of course, they should be answered. But spreading misinformation is, um, yeah, I I think it is disastrous. And you can see that in many countries around the world. Let me ask you finally, is, is, there, is there an exit route? Is there a way out of this hideous plague? Presumably there is. Presumably it won't last forever. Are we talking about annual booster inoculations, as the head of Pfizer is, is, is saying today? What, what's the Give us some hope. Is, 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 there a, is there a way out? We are in the exit route. If you look back a year today, Brian, Pfizer-BioNTech's vaccine was given approval by the MHRA. Um, it's amazing the progress that we've made in Scotland. We've got 72% uh, of everybody in the population, 83% of people over the age of 12 with the vaccine. The route out is going to be gradual. The, the pandemic ends with a whimper, not with a bang. Uh-huh. Vaccines, yes, I don't think we're going to need one every six months. We might need another one as a booster, but then it will be more vulnerable groups. So I think we'll probably get repeat vaccinations in future. Um, and hopefully we'll just learn more about this new variant we won't have to respond in the dramatic way we have, but I think things are going to be bumpy still for the next few months. But we are on the way out of this. Linda Bold, thank you very, very much indeed, particularly for that note at the end. But thank you for answering the, the questions so frankly. And thanks thanks to all the, the viewers, listeners. I'm not sure how you describe them on a podcast, but thanks to everyone who brought in with the questions. Professor Bold, thank you very, very much indeed. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to move thanks. now to our, our two Political guests, uh, Claire Adamson and uh, Miles Briggs, uh, are due to, to join me now. Thanks uh, both indeed for for, for, for joining. Let, let, let's pick up on let's pick up on that point right at the end there. Claire, Claire and, and Miles, is there a is, you know we're right in the middle of Omicron looks awful, it looks dreadful. I think Jason Leach said this morning, if you look down a microscope, it's 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 catastrophic. Perhaps it won't be as bad on the ground. Claire, are there any signs of hope that we're coming out of this? Is there any up upbeat note at all, or is it all universally gloomy? I think we have to take take that from the expert, as you said, Linda, who said that, you know, things are getting better. Um, I think that the, it will we'll come out of it as a whimper, not as a bang. I think that's really important. It'll be a gradual process of recovery and gradually getting over it. But I do think that the, you know, the vaccines have been absolutely key to this. They've been the game changer. And if people continue to get vaccinated and follow the advice Follow the face masks, wear face masks, keep keep washing hands, surfaces. If we continue to do that, then I do think there's genuinely real hope. But of course, the the, the Omicron variant has emerged in cases in Glasgow, cases in your own Lanarkshire, not necessarily in your backyard, because that's a very large large area. That must give you cause for concern, particularly as an MSP from that area. Well, I think we do. But I think we also have to, to, you know, uh, variants of these, these kind of viruses aren't unexpected yeah. um we, we what we don't know is what they're going to be this one seems to be a particularly um you know big change in the number of variations that are there but um as as linda said i, th- I think we have to t- take heart from th- the fact that we don't think this is going to be individual people any less ill um of course if it's more transmissible that again could lead to large numbers of people being ill which again puts the pressure on the health service that we're all so familiar with. Miles, any 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 cheery notes? Any any exit route inside? I, th- I think from all the questions you've just put to Linda, sort of demonstrates Brian and um, the uncertainty, oh, the worry, anxiety, worry, see that the concerns people have, and I think quite rightly. I also think going by my own mailbag, I don't know if Claire's had the same, but 
this timing ahead of Christmas has, has I think, really spooked people. Yeah. People were hoping to be able to see friends, family, to plan a bit of cheer. Yeah. And they're now really questioning that, especially people who are more vulnerable or older who, you know, I've had an email saying um, that they weren't going to go and spend Christmas with their kids um, because of this. Yeah. And so it is really sad, I think, for a lot of people that this does feel a bit of a step back um, when we make such a good progress. You begin to think, will this damn virus ever relent? You know, just a few weeks from Christmas and it comes up on another variant to, 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 to spook us. Okay, that, 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 let, let's, let's, let's park that, that optimism for a second. We had a discussion, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask the two of you about this, a discussion at First Minister's Questions about the, 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 the attempt to, to enhance the use of the booster and you know the, the new guidance that it should be a, sh a shorter period, I think it was three months rather than six from your second inoculation. But Claire, the First Minister was being asked about, you know, it didn't seem that the, 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 the system on the ground was ready for that when folk were being turned away. Um, uh, the, the Conservative leader, Douglas Ross, said it was a mess. I don't think it's a mess. I, th I think we have to to, to recognise that it, it, it's been unfortunate, and it's I, I I do feel for those who have been affected by that. But it, it's not a systemic issue by any stretch of the imagination. And and now that we know that these things have happened, you know the the information has been put in place to ensure that um the right information is given to people who who are are seeking to get the boosters. Um, incredible, incredible work that has been done in terms of, of the whole vaccine rollout in Scotland. It's been recognised by the World Health Organisation and it's really important that we don't discourage people from coming forward because, um, you know, they think that it's, it's going to waste their time or it's not going to happen. You know, the system is and should be working much better now. Yeah. And, and I, say, I, I do feel for those that were affected, but, but we have to you, get you on say, and do this. You say we should discourage people from coming forward. We these were folk who came forward. And because yes. of because of a what Nicola Sturgeon describes as a glitch in the system, they were turned away. And, and that's not very good. It's not a good look, is it? Well no, it, it it's not. And I, I, I know that it it has happened in, in Lanarkshire as well. But but the information is now getting to the centres to, so that they understand, you know, who, who's entitled to get the, the, the vaccine when they turn up. So, um, yes, it's not perfect. I think the first thing the First Minister said when we were dealing with the pan pandemic was we wouldn't get everything right. There would be mistakes along the way. But in, in general, I mean, 88% of the population over the age of 18 now double dosed and, and, and get, get in the boosters. So we are on track and we're doing very, very well in this. And, and let's not forget that that process, according to the World Health Organization, has saved 27,000 lives in yeah, Scotland. Yeah. That's that's the big picture here. Miles, I'm sure you would join in, in praising those who are working on the ground, but, but your, you, your party, your leader, was decidedly critical of, of the way the, the, the information was processed and transmitted by the Scottish Government. Yeah, and I think, you know, reading between the lines, I think the First Minister was accepting that criticism to my, and, and apologise for that, to be quite sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have seen poor communications this week because I've been advising people based on what uh, the First Minister was saying, which was people should turn up and, you know, if they're desperate for the booster, it should be there for them. That hasn't been the case in many cases, and I think that is regrettable and, and something we should correct. I've got history on this as a Lothian MSP because we've had a lot of issues um, in Lothian, yeah. people not getting yeah. invitations when they have turned up, um, not being able to get the appointment they were actually planning to have, and especially older vulnerable people being failed during that. So I think it is important we look to, as this is going to have to be boosted, we're going to have to boost the booster program and yeah. um, whether or not we can look at more mass vaccinations going forward and and potential to to get back up to the sort of levels we were delivering um, early on in the pandemic. Ex explain that mass vaccination because John Swinney was asked about that and he said there is mass vaccination it's a gigantic endeavor but you're talking about specific centers aren't you to to that would the difficulty not be there that, that it wouldn't be orderly it wouldn't be processed folk would turn up and perhaps they'd turn up in vast numbers on a on a, on a Tuesday night when, when the centre's half empty on, on, a, on a Thursday? Well, it's how you manage that. And I think to some extent we saw people who were getting their invitations attending, and that's in terms of both the first and second vaccine, and very much these people are desperate to get the booster. Yeah. I think for those yeah. who now want to potentially start getting the second um, or actually turning up to get the booster, who are in work, who can't necessarily change their appointment you know I haven't had an appointment for a booster for example and um, I don't know if that's in the pipeline but whether or not people can start and um, to be flexible where they go for those I think something we should look at obviously the health the workforce is a question there and I 
I think that's why Douglas was being quite straightforward when he said, you know, it's not going to be the same scale we've seen um, because people are back to doing other work now. Um, but whether or not we can find additional capacity is something I think we should look at. And, and that's where, you know, we need to try to get this booster program up and running to prevent any uh, potential additional cases the NHS might see. But Claire, this, this shortening of the, the time gap between the second inoculation and, and the booster has brought, I think John Swinney said it was 1.3 million additional people instantly eligible because of the that very that very shortening. That, that, does that not argue for mass vaccination centres or does it? what's your take on that? Well, I, th- I think it, it, it's a challenge, and, and yes, that's it. You know, that's almost a fifth of the population, so it's a huge exercise just for those ad- ad- additional people. But I think what we learned, I think the fast vaccination centres worked early days in the pandemic when people were by and large working at home, where schools were shut, um, and, and it was um, a bit easier for people to attend. But yeah. what, what we found is we we went on. Uh, younger people and people who are in work or had childcare issues all found it a lot more difficult to attend this sort of single o- option of a, an appointment at the vast centres. So I think the idea of 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 many centres and, and being open with inner communities and a bit of choice. So that self selection of people being able to book their appointment rather than be sent a letter with just a date and a time on it. I think all these things will help with that process and, and that's the way forward. Because as you said, it's not efficient use of 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 our time and resource, which is so precious at the moment in all aspects of the health service that we don't have people um, having these, you know, huge centres empty at times of the day. It's better that we we have, you know, a system that's running, you know, efficiently. How how about that, Miles? It's better to be small and small and local and deft rather than having these gigantic centres. Well, we now know what we need to try to achieve. And I think how we're going to do that in a short period of time is what we really need to assess. Um, and every bit of capacity um, to get people with a booster, I think, now needs to be utilised. And I hope we'll see that. I, I certainly think I've, I've always been concerned. People who um, you know, have sent a letter but um, can't get flexibility around their work, how do they actually go and get these vaccinations or boosters? And so I think we need to try to build in more to the system for people to be able to access these almost kind of whenever they want, you know, 24 uh, our vaccination centres might be something which health boards should look at doing. Let's let's talk about travel. Let's talk about travel. Let's talk about the, the the way that the Omicron variant arrives in the UK. We have these cases in Scotland, cases in England. We now have evidence of community transmission that's you know within within Scotland taking place. But travel seems to be still a, a, a key issue. Miles, were, were the UK government too reluctant to act over transport? I mean, the suggestion has been that. But you know, even their own experts, the SAGE experts, have advised us to, to all the governments on, on these islands, were saying there should be pre-travel tests of, of uh, travellers, and yet that was set aside by, by UK ministers. No, I, I think I agree with what Linda said in the first uh, section. I think what we've seen has been proportionate. Um, it's been evidence-based. Um, what we really need to do, though, and I think all governments around the world are doing this as we speak, is this is a hugely movable situation, as Linda outlined, and, and we need to therefore see and what's going to have the biggest impact. And we've learned a lot about clunky lockdown procedures we've used and how they don't necessarily have the desired outcome. Um, So I think part of this going forward for all governments across the world is actually how you're going to make sure you can really use these tools, which are, like I say, quite clunky uh, to to prevent the spread of of the virus. But most people who are traveling are vaccinated and have some sort of test taking place. And I think that's where be it a PCR or lateral flow test, um, you know, that's taking place already. So we're in a better place than we were at the beginning of this pandemic. But the Scottish government's arguing that the, the PCR test on arrival should be not just after two days, but a further one after after eight days. What, I put that to Linda earlier. What, what's your thinking on that? What, why, why, is, why, why would that be advantageous potentially? Well, I, I, I just, you know, again, we listen to the experts and Linda's definitely an expert in that area. And, and her take is, is that there may be people who arrive and, and it's, there isn't enough building up in their system yeah. to show on a PCR test. So, so it's, it's, it's a, a belt and braces way of looking at it. It's a second test. It, it's, you know, a, a, a confidence that the, the, the person um, doesn't have COVID. COVID and this variant when, when they do um, actually come out and come out of isolation and, and go, go about their business that yeah. they hear for us. So. It's, it's about proportionate as well, isn't it, isn't it, Claire? Because you, you, we haven't gone, we've got this, this, this worry about Omicron, there's the worry that it's 
more transmissible. There's the worry that it, that it that it's perhaps more resistant to vaccination. There's the worry, although there's no evidence yet that it could could be um, more damaging than, than the other variants. And yet we haven't gone for for instant lockdown, have we? Is that is that a is that about this player? Is that about this business of being proportionate? Well, it's about proportionate, and it, I, again, as Linda said, it's about you know the first thing you, you do is is, is protect, protect the health service, yeah. and then you look at the, the the wider issues. So we we're looking at something we don't want to cause huge damage to the economy and the wider um, community by um being be too prescriptive on what we do right away. But that also means that we are asking people to do what's been asked for them up to now, and that's like you know. Um, I, th- I think, you know, I would say it from walking around the shops, from see- dealing with people they had, you know, this is a huge reminder that the pandemic is not over, that, that COVID is still with us and that we still have to follow the rules. So, and, and that's the advice for Christmas as well, you know, um, people, you know, please, you know, if you can meet up with your family, but do the lateral flow test, okay. ventilate the house, spend some time outdoors if it's possible at all, all these things that will help. That is really interesting. I'm going to pick up on that in a second. But Miles, I want to give you a chance to comment on the the issue of you know we 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 haven't gone for lockdown. We haven't we've 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 increased in England. They said start wearing face masks. That was already happening in Scotland. There's more constraint on travel from from abroad, but we really haven't jumped into lockdown. Presumably, you believe that's the right approach, both in England and Scotland. Yes, and it's you know making sure, like Claire's already outlined, um, you know we have lost so much during this in terms of. Our children's education, uh, businesses going to the wall, that just to lock down every single time we see a mutation and a new variant can't happen. We all need to accept that. I think where we can be proportionate, um, we're being we're doing just that. And I think that's um, you know, each government will have to take their own decisions on this, but I think certainly, hopefully in the next few weeks we'll have this a uh, science around this to to show us whether or not um this is a variant strain which we really need to take further steps on but at the minute I think it's been proportionate and and certainly in terms of all our measurements about uh, hospitalizations things like that um that seems to be the case so I, I think we've just learned like I've said far more than we were at the beginning of this pandemic and our scientists and scientific scientific advisors and medical advisors um probably are in a better place as well in advising politicians what to do. Uh, Miles Claire let me ask you each uh, I'm Miles going to pick up with you on that point that Claire raised there which I find extremely Interesting. There's, there's, it's, it's not, it's not resistance. It's not rebellion. It's not insurrection. It's just folk are sick, fed up of these constraints. They're sick, fed up of these blasted masks. They're sick, fed up. Of, you know, when, when they wear them, when, when, when they don't. And I think Nicola Sturgeon herself said, you know, you, you, you can see the evidence that folk are beginning to just drift away from it. Do, do we, do we, you know, do we condemn that or do we need to understand it? What, what miles first, then, then clear. No, I think everyone's absolutely sick to the back teeth of this uh, awful disease. I think part of of that is people feel they've lost. You know, I really feel sorry for older people and um, who are retired who feel like they've lost uh, two years out of their retirement during this period as well. But young people as well who have been really impacted. And um, I chaired a cancer conference on Monday, a Scottish cancer conference, where we were discussing the impact this has had on patients and health inequalities and. You know, I'm really concerned that what we've actually done is going to put a lot of our cancer outcomes back years, decades, and the most, uh, you know, health. Why is that? Please like say that. that. That's really what I was thinking. Well, we were making really great progress across a lot of cancer outcomes um, in Scotland. Claire and I sit in a number of cross-party groups on health outcomes here in the Parliament, and and part of the work we've done is encouraging people who wouldn't present early, for example, with cancer to do that. And we were making slow, steady progress around things like lung cancer and, and other, um, you know, less survivable cancers. And um, anecdotally, we're now hearing kind of people have not wanted to go near the health service. They think the health service has just wanted to deal with COVID. During is that because they, they, they don't want to bother the health service or, or they're also worried about, you know, catching some disease. If, 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 yeah. uh, like, I, well, well, both both of those aspects but it's building people's confidence again that the health service is there that everybody who has a concern should go and see their gp we need people to do that and um you know i think that's a message claire and i um you know have been regularly saying but but sadly that's not the reality people um who don't want to go near their gp who um sometimes are in the most deprived communities in scotland don't necessarily seek out that help and 
that will have a de detrimental impact on all our cancer outcomes as we come out of this. And we need to actually get back to that focus on other health issues. Right. Mental health being one we've not touched on, but the mental health impact of this is absolutely huge as well. Yeah, let's run with that. Let's run with that as, as, as a topic. Are you also concerned that, that other, other health um, uh, uh, areas of, of to be addressed are, are being, it's not neglected, it's not overlooked. It, it's, it's just that the focus has to be upon, upon COVID. But I, yes, and I, and I think the, the you know these are really really difficult decisions at all times with the pandemic. But what we have seen now is that screening is back up and running. That um you know that encouragement is there for people to come forward for screening, and and really the message is that that people should see their GP if they have concerns. Um, I just um led a member's debate on pancreatic cancer. That's a, an incredibly difficult cancer because the survivor rates, rates are low and it's very, very aggressive. So um, early diagnosis for the, that is key. And I, I'm glad to see that the, 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 you know, the, the one-stop shops for diagnosis centres for cancer are, are coming on in Scotland. So work is being done and progress has been done because these things are being recognised. But there's no doubt that, that you know, for years... We'll be, we'll be dealing with some of these issues, including the mental health issues. Well, let's, let's talk about the mental health issue. How, how concerned are you about that, Claire? And then, and then, and Miles. Well, I, I think it's it's difficult. I mean, Miles mentioned elderly people and younger people. I've got a twenty four year old son. My mum's eighty five, so I see both of these aspects yeah. of the impact that this has had on them. So, um, yeah, it's it, it, it's hard, and um, but. It, but the upside of that is there's a lot of work being done in our communities and um, with third sector organisations really, really came up, came to the fore in terms of support yeah. and well-being. I think the storms at the weekend have shown us that we need more community resilience there as well to be able to support um, vulnerable people in, in, in situations like this. So I, I, I think it's all about building that community spirit behind what we're doing in terms of a well-being um, economy which we're all moving towards as well yeah. so it's, it's about really br bringing these strands together and, and seeing how we can work going forward to ensure supports there to ensure the opportunities to get support are there particularly for our young people and and, and to really build that resilience in our, our communities going forward miles, to you, deal with this miles you raised that issue of mental health presumably you're, you're, you're gravely concerned that that is something that will have been it, it's 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 a double disaster, isn't it? Because the problems will have been uh, will have been enhanced, uh, and yet perhaps the, the the remedies will have been constrained. Absolutely, and I think across the age groups is where we kind of need to find a solution. And um, you know, I know older friends who have kind of lost their confidence during uh, this, but I wouldn't say you know that's a mental health concern. But I know people whose whose children now have anxiety issues, yeah. and that's something which has has really grown. My real concern is that. We don't have the services necessarily for non-crisis uh, mental health services in place. And um, like for an Ed in Edinburgh, for example, the, the average wait for a child to see someone is now over a year. For an adult, it's over two years. So, you know, the health board, there's no point for GPs to refer people almost to these services. Um, it's worse to say, oh, you'll be, you'll, you'll be maybe seen in two years by someone. So I think we need to, like Claire touched upon, really look at what services are going to be out there to help support people and not build the best crisis service, but try to to get this um, at a grassroots level across communities. And the third sector used to do so much of this. They've obviously had the same pressures of lockdown as every every other organization. And I, I worry that they're not in the sort of place we we would hope at this moment to pick up a lot of that work. As and when it comes. And hopes to do revive that. But we've, we've got a, a lot of time left. So I'm going to turn you to, I mean, what we're we are in, in past years obliged to call the festive season. I'm not sure it'll be all, all that festive, but perhaps we can we can still make it as as, as festive as possible. I'm I'm a I'm not a Scrooge on these matters, but I'm 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 slightly slightly skeptical as I always am about everything. Um, Claire, should we change? Should we scale back Christmas? Should we should we abandon the Christmas party? Should we, you know, what 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 should we do? How should we respond to this this um, COVID afflicted Christmas for a, for a, a further year? I, th I think it's you know down to individuals. I mean, we're, we're we're not having Christmas parties this year. We might have a Christmas lunch in a you know, and observe the social distancing and, and safety measures through through that, is, that is point that, is of view. That, is that at work in Parliament? Or, 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 or yeah, no, the, in terms of the Parliament yeah. environment and, and, and the office. Um, uh, families, I mean, the, the advice is still there. Big family groups should, you know, use the ventilation in the houses, you yeah. know, um, go outside if you can, you yeah. know, and 
And that's really just about people, you know, changing their behaviour at these things and, and, and just being really um, cognizant of, of the issues. I, I do notice that the Parliament's actually going to have its carol service this year. Um, at one point, you know, I didn't think that would happen. That is happening this year. And that's an absolute delight because it is a, a sense of a little bit of normality. To that's that's so it's, the, it's always in the garden lobby, isn't it? It's a, a, yes. A uh -huh. And the, the, the children will be coming in from next door at the school as usual or or some variant of that will happen. And I think that's that that it, it's about proportion and it's about that safety and the risk assessment and people just not not behaving in a way as if it's just all gone away. Um, just be safe in what people are doing. That's interesting. So, yeah, uh, Miles, is that that your take as well? You know, it's it's you you can still celebrate Christmas, but you know, car canny as as well. What what's the? I mean, folk are worried. Folk are anxious. They're really you you made that point earlier. Folk are really fretful. Yeah, but you can probably just see. I've put my tinsel up in my office already, Brian. To yes, trying to get some oh, oh, festive oh, oh, going on here. Oh, yeah. But um, yeah, no, no, absolutely. And I think one of the the key things is as. I to almost think back a year, um, which was an awful Christmas, but this one I hope we're not in that position. And I think just some of the the things we now have in place for people to do these tests, to order them in advance if they want um, from the NHS. You know, like Linda said, we're incredibly lucky that as a country you can just order these free, get them, and then if you're concerned, if you know, there's more of flus and coughs and things going around this time of year anyway. So if any of that's there, test. If you're positive, do not start attending things because I think that's where we can all play our individual role to collectively keep this under control but I think people just in general will probably not be wanting to be doing too many households it's all about household mixing at the end of the day so I hope people can have their family unit for Christmas um, but people just be mindful of how this disease potentially spreads and you know none of us want to see the NHS overwhelmed we're in a good place and I think just common sense and us all thinking about our health and potential impacts is something we should do. You think we're in a, a you think we're in a good place? We we are potentially in a good place anyway. We are beginning to see light, or I mean, Omicron, regardless. Yeah, you know, we've we've had these bumps in the road, as Linda said. There, there's plenty more to come, and um, like colds and flus, this will mutate, and uh, you know, going for forward forever now. So I think part of our our real conversation is how are we going to control this? I hope it turns into like. Uh, the flu jab, for example, will have to have one annually as we see different strains in different parts of the world. And as it mutates, it gets weaker as well, hopefully, um, being part of not ever being uh, in a position where our NHS could be overwhelmed by cases. Um, but I do feel um, the, the action we've taken, especially when you look at uh, the vaccination program um, a year on, I, I've been absolutely amazed um, we are where we are. Um, and actually now we need to work globally to do that, because as, as of today, 55% of the world has have had at least one vaccination. That's not good enough, uh, but at least we as the United Kingdom have really um, topped uh, that outcome in, in Europe. And we need to keep making sure that, that we protect our own citizens. But I think we need to think globally about this. Well, it's, 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 interesting, it's, it's interesting, Claire. I mean, it's interesting because if we, if, if we don't do it out of sheer common humanity to assist people in, in, in areas where they're not getting the vaccination, then, then blunt self-interest should, should should kick in as well because unless we protect the whole of the globe, we can't protect ourselves. Omicron and and, and other uh, variants prove that. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And um, time and again, when we talk about health or, or economic inequality, it's it's the same areas that are hit by this every time. Um, although we don't know if Om Om of this variant Omicron started in. South Africa, it was identified in South Africa, it's quite a low rate. And it's a reminder to us all that we really have to push governments to work internationally to ensure that this the vaccines are, are available um, uh, you know, to, to, to countries that, that just wouldn't be able to put in the um effort that the UK has and other, you know, um European countries have been able to do. Yeah. Uh, Miles, is it possible to close on a, on a, as I did with, with Linda on a on a faintly optimistic note, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm starting to feel of feel of that nature. Despite saying earlier I was skeptical and cynical, is 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 there some you know we've we've got Omicron, we've got we've got we've got millions of dive. Is is there any optimism there that we can pin to? Yeah, I, I really do hope that 2022 is a point where we can declare, probably after the winter flu season, um, that we're in a good place. That actually well, that's what, going Mark, forward Mark, next year, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, but the end of this public health emergency hopefully can be declared. And then we start to look towards how we manage this going forward um, into the summer. We had a very good summer, um, I think, where we were on top of this. And I think that's just where we have to be. But we have to be mindful of, you know, being able to move with the times and with these variants. And I think, you know, when you look globally, as we've just discussed, we're in a very good place. And I, I hope we can get back to focusing on some of the key things we should be about getting our economy back up and running um, and what we want to do to actually improve the country, because this does feel like it's that set us all back. But I think there's a lot to be positive about, and I hope people do have a good Christmas and New Year to to actually relax and, and not think about this, because sadly, most conversations uh, do lead back to COVID all the time. So let's talk about other things instead. Um, maybe not the football from last night, but something along well, those lines. Clear. Clear. Put, put on the Santa hat and cheer us up. Oh, well, um, there is um, oh, the scientists. I just want to say a thank you to all the scientists who have, have worked uh, on these vaccines. It's been an amazing effort. But but just to say also that there's also the Valneva vaccine um, out there, which doesn't work on the spike protein, which may make it more resistant to, to, to the variants of, of COVID. So the scientific community is still working its socks off to, to, to find ways of fighting this going forward. So there's, there's on that more. note, oh, that, hopefully there's more cheer. <laughs> that's not clear. Miles, thank you both very much indeed. Thanks uh, earlier to Professor Linda Ball who joined us to tag. And thanks to you. Thanks to the viewers, listeners, whatever whatever it is with regard to our podcast. I'm never entirely sure who sent in those questions. Terrific questions. And, I, and Linda gave a great effort in answering but, uh, and, and, and Miles, thanks very much indeed from me, Brian Taylor. Good luck in it. This podcast was brought to you by The Herald. Take 20% off an annual subscription to The Herald with our exclusive podcast code. Just add Herald Pod 2021 to your basket and get instant, unfiltered access to our website. And you can also get involved with The Brian Taylor Podcast as well. Tune in on Facebook, Twitter and YouTube every Thursday afternoon to catch Brian and his panel chat live and ask your questions to the people across the political scene.